there's this big mystery with coronavirus that nobody's figured out yet, and it has to do with this graph. This line shows the average number of people who died every week in England and Wales before the pandemic. Jump to 2020, and of course the figures are way higher than usual. But here's the problem. A lot of those extra deaths are obviously because people are dying with the virus. But there's something else going on. Look what happens if we take out the deaths that doctors have linked to COVID-19. So we're just left with people who died from other things, like old age or heart attacks. Even then, at certain points of 2020, there were still far more people dying than normal. That's because all these lockdown restrictions we've had, they're not good for people's health. So the question is, are we dealing with this in the right way? Here in the UK, we've had full lockdowns and other tough restrictions that are still going on now. And we all know why the government is doing it. To put the coronavirus back in its box. But I want to find out, what is the cost of lockdown? This isn't about whether you're pro or anti-lockdown, because before we get into that question, we need to know how it's actually going to impact on people's health, the economy, society. To try and understand this, I'm going to need some help. So I called up three scientists and an economist, who each have very different opinions on this. But this still won't be easy. Working out the cost of lockdown is not going to be just a simple cost-benefit analysis, because, well, lockdowns can vary. In the UK, for instance, we've had a range of different restrictions in different places at different times. The impact of any lockdown is going to depend on so many different factors. But generally, we can think about this in three categories. The health impact, the economic impact, and then the kind of broader social and cultural impact of lockdown. So I'm going to take these in order. Let's go back to that graph showing the number of deaths back in March. This is what we're interested in here. Even when you take out all the COVID deaths, the numbers are still way higher than usual. One of the main reasons for that is that when the first lockdown came in, a lot of the National Health Service was forced to close up or reduce services for people who had other diseases. Essentially, when you look at that big lump of excess deaths, and this is, these are immediate impacts in April, they, they basically constitute people who did not get the health care they should have received. We now know that cancer care was one of the areas worst affected by the first lockdown. Dr Maringe was part of a team that investigated how it impacted on patients. Very suddenly, all, all types of uh, routine diagnoses, so those that happened via the GP, general practitioners, um, were completely stopped. Since March, all of the routine diagnostic work wasn't happening and patients were coming through only via two potential routes, which are the emergency routes. Her team estimated there could be an extra 3,621 deaths in the next five years, just from four main types of cancer alone. And that's just looking at the impact of delayed diagnosis. We haven't really modelled the effect of receiving appropriate treatment and and what that might have had um, over the year. I guess we're hearing about so many COVID deaths that it seems maybe very small, but actually, you know, for for the cancer patients and and for cancers such as breast cancer, for which, you know, survival is pretty good, it's actually very bad news. Reports have even suggested there could be between 7,000 and 35,000 extra cancer deaths within one year. And that's just the impact of the first lockdown back in March. Experts also worry about patients with conditions like heart disease and lung disease. Some of that is down to what's going on in hospitals, but some of it has happened because people were just too scared to see a doctor in case they got COVID while they were in hospital. In March, the number of people who went to hospital with heart problems suddenly dropped by 50%. That's not because people magically just stopped having heart attacks in March. It's because they stopped going to A&E. The question now is whether we can avoid that happening again as we have lockdowns and restrictions throughout winter. Experts are still quite divided about that. We've been looking at data on consultations in primary care and there was a reduction, but that has largely recovered now. And of course, we are finding more and more ways of 
deal, looking after people. So telemedicine in particular, remote consultations, not for everyone, but there has been a transformation. Uh, it's not that there's a sort of permanently fixed amount of, of capacity and nothing can be done about it. People are doing a lot to, to remedy this. Others are more pessimistic. In terms of public health costs, hopefully they will be more attentive to keeping some of those uh, services functioning. But already I understand that the elective surgery list is so long that there is almost no hope of catching up. I, I don't want to sound very gloomy, but I think diagnostic capacities are not back to what they were pre-COVID. And already six, seven months have passed and, and we've missed, you know, so many patients haven't been diagnosed in that time. I think we should learn from that first wave that, you know, this stay at home message should be maybe uh, said a bit differently. If you do have symptoms, then, you know, go and, and see your GP, go to hospital, don't miss an appointment. But of course, all this has to be weighed up against the potential coronavirus death toll. After all, the whole point of lockdown is to reduce the number of people dying with COVID. A study by Imperial College London looked at what would have happened if nothing had changed back in March at all. No lockdown, no social distancing, no change to the way we behave. It estimates that if we'd not done all that, there could have been more than half a million coronavirus deaths in the UK. The government also argues that lockdowns can help save the National Health Service because if you reduce the number of COVID patients, then hospitals have more capacity to help other patients with things like cancer and heart disease. The way you prevent those services being impinged on and potentially being slowed right down or even in some cases cancelled is to keep the COVID rates down. Indeed. If you don't, then that is going to erode the NHS's capacity to do not just the COVID care, but actually the non-COVID care as well. OK, so the second aspect of this is the economic impact of lockdown. Many people will be all too familiar with this already. Thousands of jobs have been cut, businesses closed, and the government's tax revenues have fallen. And now, with restrictions extending into the winter, people are worried that some of these problems could get even worse. This graph shows the size and the growth of Britain's economy. You can see how it took a hit with the financial crash in 2008, but compare that to the overall impact of coronavirus in 2020. The damage is enormous. And remember, this crash happened even despite financial support from the government, like the furlough scheme. Six months after the first lockdown began in March, 673,000 staff positions were cut from companies across the UK. In October, statistics showed the number of people being made redundant had risen at the fastest rate since records began. But an economic crash isn't just bad news for business. There's a great deal of evidence that when people lose jobs and then find it st struggle hard to find another job for many, many months, that the impact that has on their health, on stress, on anxiety, on their mental health is substantial. And research, I think, is pretty persuasive in suggesting that large-scale job losses have very substantial long-term health issues on, on the people affected. Now, that might sound like lockdowns are a bad idea, but the problem economists have is that it's very hard to distinguish between the effect of lockdown and the effect of simply being in a pandemic. Even if we'd never gone into lockdown, coronavirus itself would have still damaged the economy. Some people will just naturally decide to stay home a lot more because they don't want to risk catching it, and that means shops and businesses will lose out, even if there's no legal restrictions. There's another argument here as well. When England's winter lockdown was announced a few weeks ago, the government said, look, of course, this is going to be tough, but it's better to have a short lockdown now rather than potentially having to do something even more drastic later on. Clearly there's a large number of companies, a very large number of companies in the UK that were severely damaged by the first lockdown, may have held on, they haven't given up the ghost, they haven't just packed up and shut up shop and declared bankruptcy, but they may be significant numbers right on the verge of, you know, can we, can we actually carry on? The final thing we need to consider when weighing up the cost of lockdown is the kind of social and cultural impact the stuff that everyone is painfully aware of. We can't go out and see our friends like normal. We can't even visit our own families. 
People lying in hospitals being told they can't have visitors and elderly people in particular become isolated. This isn't just about not being able to go to the pub. This is people's lives. It affects mental health and loneliness. Even just the most fundamental things, like being able to hold a funeral, are disrupted with limits on who can attend. Meanwhile, you've got films, music, theatre productions, art exhibitions, festivals, nightlife, travel, holidays, all put on hold. And OK, you can't really put a number on this. It's not something we can measure and plot on a graph. But if you're trying to balance up the pros and cons of lockdown, this is definitely something we've got to try and factor in. This pandemic, though, is really an ever-changing crisis. That means it's almost impossible to weigh up all these different factors in advance and then decide what approach to take. I mean, we could spend hours talking about all the things that might affect whether a lockdown is worth it or not. Like how much funding our hospitals have or how well we can treat people with coronavirus, public awareness, seasonal variations. These are all going to play into the question of whether a lockdown causes more harm than good. Essentially, you've got the scale of where the costs of lockdown and the costs of the risk of getting the virus and the deaths that it entails, um, that shifts. So for me, within this microcosm, the costs of lockdown and the, the e don't outweigh, actually, really, the costs of the risk of getting virus. Um, but if you think of a deprived household, the costs of lockdown mean job loss, mean not being able to put food on the table. For the time being, people are just going to carry on arguing about whether it's worth having restrictions or not. But if we can learn more about the precise costs and benefits of lockdown, we might start to bridge some of these divides and get a better understanding of the crisis we're all living through.